drinking a half a bottle of Jack Daniels every night, going from funeral to funeral, down like a dark place, thinking about all the things that you think I would think about. God loves us unconditionally, but we have an opportunity to screw this up. We can get this wrong. It's the devil whispering us in our ear. We're not good enough. You shouldn't be this way. Don't worry about this. I mean, we all have very subtle things that we deal with on how spiritual warfare works, and it will seep into every aspect of our lives if we let it. I want to start at the very beginning. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in New England. That environment definitely played a part in my life, you know, being around the water. Mom and my dad were just yelling at the top of their lungs together, uh, battling and arguing over me. One of the hardest things I ever remember as a child is I have this person in front of me that I have no idea who they are, t sitting here asking me to choose of which parent I wanted to go with, right? I'm in a courtroom in Providence, my mother's sobbing her eyes out, my dad's standing there at the end of the table, and they're like, which parent are you gonna, you know, which parent are you gonna go with here? And so like my dad was the fun guy, right? My, dad, my mom had to do all the things that were tough. She had to get me to school. She had to make sure I was eating right. She had to make sure that I was getting taken care of. She was on welfare for a while. I remember her using food stamps for, for quite a while. My buddy John Devine, we were best friends growing up. We have childhood memories of running around the neighborhood with each other, playing paintball, playing tag, manhunt, all those things. Like, that was us. And I remember one day we were walking down the road and, uh, you know, he kind of mumbled something like, oh, there's these guys that are like the tip of the spear that are like super awesome. And my dad's friend knows them. And uh, he knows a guy that's one of those dudes. And I was kind of like, wait a minute, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, there's like Navy SEAL guys. What is that? I want to know more about that. I was hooked from that moment. And I think our next trip was to the library where they had like two books you know, in the library on Navy SEALs. It was like, one was like a picture book and one was like the history of Vietnam. Trained and equipped to conduct unconventional warfare and clandestine operations, SEAL teams were tasked with maintaining capabilities. Sitting on the front porch, we were playing with GI Joes, and I looked him in the eye and I was like, I'm gonna bet you that I become a SEAL first. And he's like, all right, deal. And we shook on it. And it was 50 <laughs> bucks. <laughs> That was all kind of natural to us. I mean, we would go down the end of the road and surf torture each other, you know, for hours on end. Uh, we'd go to the local pool and try to drown each other and tie each other up. When he made it, it was like, boom, we just sparked it. Dude, you made it. There's two best friends growing up across the street from each other and then you made it, I made it, and here we are, you know? But, you know, my mother was very tough on me um, from a standpoint of like, she'd have no problem like smacking me off of a seat if I did something wrong. Mentally, could kind of get to me like my inner core. You know, like she was the person yelling at me on the phone while I was in Bud's getting ready to go to Hell Week, like motivating me, right? So she had that tenacity where it's like, don't you dare think about quitting. And my troop chief looked right at me and he said, you're probably not gonna make it, you're too young. I showed up to Gold Squadron when I was 23 years old. As I was like, I wonder how many guys have got in here at 23. <laughs> I went and looked at the board and there was, I think the youngest guy was like 25 or 26. And so as we grew, we've lost guys in the midst of these battles. Not to mention we're going after bad dudes that are blowing people up and killing innocent people. Me, Eddie and Lewis were like the three man team <laughs> that, that we just had so much fun together, so effective. We lost Lewis in a houseborn IED. He was like my best friend, you know? That night we were up, you know, on this, on this structure, and I think somebody had tossed a frag in the door. 
And that's when the house came down. And when they pulled back, you know, Lewis was right there on the corner. People are mangled. Um, there's dust everywhere. It was just like, I just saw this house and this structure, and now it's all in, you know, a pile of concrete. And I'm kind of like looking into their eyes, like, okay, is he all right? He looks a little banged up. He's moving. And then right after I kind of had that pause, I was like, where's Lewis? I was like, where is he? And I'm just thinking, help my buddy. Help my buddy. What can I do to help him? But, you know, when we got word back that, uh, you know, he didn't make it, I want to say that I just went out and dropped to my knees. But there's <clears throat> beauty that comes from all of it. You, you start to understand, you know, what brotherhood is. And, you know, that loss is, is just impacts you in a different way. It is the most challenging thing that I've ever done in my entire life about anything, being a father. Because I truly care about my children and I truly want them to be better. So if I'm going to live the truth and I'm going to really do that the way I say I'm going to, then I have to turn inward and say, am I doing that to the best of my ability? We have to be the example. Don't just tell our children to do something. Live it out at every step of the way. You know, especially again with our faith. You know, what are we doing to really lean into that that shows them that it's important? Or are we just going through the motions?